Acts chapter 17, verses 32 through 33. Acts 17, beginning in verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. In our last study, the Apostle Paul delivered a speech before the Areopagus in Athens. We determined that the Areopagus was a court, and this speech is properly understood as a legal defense against the charge that Paul was threatening Athenian culture by preaching foreign gods. While in a very real sense Paul was guilty of the charge, he defended himself and sought to justify a further hearing for his message from the citizens of Athens by masterfully demonstrating how the God of the Hebrew Scriptures, which he never cited but flawlessly represented, is the answer to all of the longing questions embedded in the history of Greek religion and expressed by the greatest thinkers of Greek society. In the course of his speech, Paul made several intense charges against the Greeks. They worshipped in ignorance. They were, on their own, in the search for the true God, like a blind man, groping around tragically and pathetically for something just beside him. Their whole religious system, with its temples and idols and sacrifices, was utterly opposed to reason. In reality, they were no better than any other nation of men. And whatever prominence and accomplishment they had enjoyed, it had been given to them by God for His purposes. Although they did not know Him, He knew them and had predetermined their rise and fall. In his conclusion, Paul declared that, though it might have seemed this God of which he spoke, if He were real, had been strangely absent from their history, the times of ignorance were now over, and God commands all men everywhere to turn to him, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. So just as the sermon conveyed the message of Moses and the prophets without quoting from them, it led to the proclamation of Jesus the Messiah without naming him. But though unnamed, He was the same Jesus Paul had preached in every synagogue, right down to his death and resurrection. In fact, the last words of Paul's speech were, He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In the synagogues, it was the death of the Messiah that stirred up the most controversy, especially the idea of death by crucifixion, at the hands of the Jews themselves. On Mars Hill, however, it was the resurrection. Picking up in verse 32, And when they, that is the philosophers and Athenians who were present, and the members of the court, heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, or more literally, some began to sneer. New American Standard Version. The text indicates that the sneering or mockery resulted in the disruption of the speech and the breaking up of the court. We cannot say that Paul was found guilty, and certainly no sentence was passed. Rather, it appears that those who might have been the most concerned with his preaching initially became suddenly flippant toward him and began to view him as more of a pitiful joke than a real threat to the city. It reminds us of Luke's earlier observation that they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So perhaps the arrest of Paul was motivated more by a morbid curiosity all along than a genuine concern. And the resurrection from the dead was no new thing. It was an idea that had long ago been dismissed, and the whole of Greek society had been built on its dismissal. This is a very important point. In his commentary on Acts, McGarvey expressed surprise at the same oddity which we just observed. Quote, 
There are two strange features in the conduct of this audience. First, that they listened so patiently while Paul was demonstrating the folly of their idolatrous worship, which we would expect them to defend with zeal. Second, that they should interrupt him with mockery when he spoke of a resurrection from the dead, which we would have expected them to welcome as a most happy relief from the gloom which shrouded their thoughts of death. It is true this whole scene unfolds counterintuitively. They handle the insult well, and in the end, they terminate the discussion because they are repulsed by the message that Christians call good news. McGarvey was probably correct in his explanation of their patience toward Paul's critique of idolatry. He notes, This is accounted for by the prevailing infidelity among philosophic minds in reference to the popular worship rendering formal and heartless with them a service which was still performed by the masses with devoutness and sincerity. Since Paul drew his critical observations from the writings of the philosophers and poets themselves, this is likely an accurate assessment, and it meant that they might have even nodded their heads in agreement of at least part of the first half of his speech. But the repulsion by the concept of resurrection deserves some special attention. McGarvey's comment about the gloom which shrouded their thoughts of death is rather anachronistic. The reality is that the Greek rejection of resurrection was precisely because their philosophical systems had taught them not to fear death. The Epicureans were utter materialists who believed in annihilation at death. The Stoics had a limited concept of life after death that was more in keeping with the earlier views of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Those earlier views had the most potent impact on the shaping of the Greek mind and bear some special consideration. Recall that Socrates was, as we've mentioned several times in these studies, tried and condemned by the Areopagus of his own day for corrupting the youth of Athens and sentenced to death. The manner in which he would be executed might seem especially grim and strange to us moderns. He would be forced to take his own life by drinking a poison called hemlock. In one of the best-known dialogues of Plato, a discussion is preserved between Socrates and some of his students who tried to convince him that he should not submit to death but should rather flee and preserve his life. In the end, Socrates convinces them all that death is the better option for him, as indeed it is the better option for all men. In the ancient Greek mind, life in the physical world is a prison in which the soul is trapped. This is a world of hopeless corruption and degrading passions. Only in death is the soul released to go on living at a higher and nobler level. This idea was not only embraced and expounded on by Socrates, but also by his students and the heirs of his school. Platonic philosophy, that is, the form that developed under the teaching of Plato, evolved over time, but there are a few fundamental concepts that we would do well to understand. First, there is a strong dichotomy here between the physical and the spiritual. The physical world, with which lower appetites and exertions are concerned, is hopelessly imperfect. The spiritual is the realm of the philosopher, the realm of the mind, where the high work of contemplation of ideas takes place. The physical world and all things pertaining to it are irredeemable, and therefore life spent in physical endeavors is essentially a life wasted while life devoted to the spiritual is well spent. These principles led to a stratification of society that was explored in Plato's Republic. In this stratification, the philosophers were the highest members of the social circle, and the entrepreneurs were the lowest. Now, Paul's affirmation of the resurrection was not merely a threat, but a direct undermining of that whole system. If the body is raised then there is not a hard distinction between the physical and the spiritual. The body and the soul are equally important components of the human person. As Paul will say in another place, the soul without a body is unclothed, and this is an undesirable condition. The body, 
And in fact, in a theology fully informed by the resurrection, the whole of physical creation was declared good by its maker, manifests his glory even in a state of corruption, and will be redeemed in his eternal purpose. If this is so, there is not really so much of a difference between the philosopher and the entrepreneur at all. They are both ministering to the same creation, and both have essentially the same capacity to accomplish something meaningful by their work. Belief in the resurrection from the dead, then, would be the end of the culture that gave power and authority to the very men Paul was addressing. If it was believed widely, it would be the great equalizer, convincing all humanity, from masters to slaves, from philosophers to entrepreneurs, that the discharge of their gifts and talents and the stewardship of the earth was cooperative and co-important. There is no proper gradation of value in the works of education, beautification, and benevolence. Now, as helpful as it would be to continue exploring that idea and to contemplate what a society truly informed by Christianity and the hope of the resurrection would look like, I think we should rather spend a little time considering how this conflict between the message of the Christian gospel and the worldview shaped by Greek philosophy manifests in the modern world, especially in the thinking of modern Western Christians. Greek philosophy had an early negative impact on Christianity with the development of Gnosticism. And early post-apostolic church leaders disputed over the relationship that should exist or not between the teachings of the philosophers and those of Christ. Men like Justin Martyr tried their own hand at the work of Paul on Mars Hill, seeking to establish some continuity between the two. While others, like Tertullian, famously decried, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Augustine considered the Christian appropriation of Greek philosophy to be a noble venture of the armies of King Jesus plundering the treasures of the heathen. But others have considered this sort of synthesis to be more like drinking the hemlock than plundering the storehouse. Through the influence of the scholastics in the Middle Ages, there can be little doubt that the Western Christian mind has been heavily influenced by Platonic ideas. In Western Christianity, one will often find a strong dichotomy between the secular and the sacred. Secular things are physical or earthy things, things that do not seem to have any spiritual nature to them. Years ago, it was common to hear preachers condemn going to a bowling alley or playing horseshoes in the yard because these things were worldly. But in this way of thinking, worldly did not mean that they were motivated by unrighteous passions, rather that they were simply not spiritual. In modern Western Christianity, one is likely to find the average believer expressing his hope in terms of making it through the difficulties of this life so that he can go to heaven when he dies. Some, while affirming the historic resurrection of Jesus, reject the general bodily resurrection of the dead or any redemption of creation on the same basis as the ancient pagan Greeks. The world is hopelessly corrupt, they say, and the best God can do with it is to annihilate it in a conflagration. Within this framework, pastors and preachers are regarded as the spiritual people, and the rest of the church, the majority who are not inclined or gifted toward the academic study of Scripture or the eloquent articulation of sermons or defense of the faith, consider themselves, and perhaps are considered by others, second-class Christians. Their religious duties are essentially limited to attending religious gatherings, participating to some degree in religious rituals, and giving money to fund the spiritual work of the clergy. The normal work of that lower class is not evil per se, but it is ultimately pointless. They're simply rearranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship while the spiritual workers are doing the truly valuable work of getting people into the lifeboats by helping them detach their affections from a worthless world around us and instead to think of a home over there. I would suggest that a truly Christian worldview one formed by the revelation of God beginning in Genesis 1 and having the resurrection 
not merely the past resurrection of Jesus, but the future bodily resurrection of mankind, of which Jesus was the first fruits, as its capstone, would lead us to a very different outlook on life and faith. In reality, while there is a distinction between the holy and the common, there is not a hard distinction in Scripture between the secular and the spiritual. Yes, there are preachers and elders and ministries that focus on the word and prayer, and yes, these ministries are different from serving tables and improving society and caring for nature and crafting beautiful things and exploring the functions of the broader creation, but all of those things, when carried out by men and women who love and praise God through Christ and acknowledge Him as the source of life and beauty and power, are contributing to God's eternal purpose. His eternal purpose is not the rescue of souls from this present hell of physicality, but rather the redemption of creation from sin. And it is accomplished in part by the present efforts of the redeemed to restore the glory of God to this world until it is filled up with it. That is not a work of a sacred few. Rather, it is the function of the whole body and all of its members, whatever their particular functions may be. The Apostle Paul bases his instructions for relationships, for sexual ethics, for attitudes toward work and the value of the human person, and much more on the revelation of Christ that the body, the physical body, is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Your bodies, says Paul, are members of Christ. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20 I do not think it is too much to say that the integrity of the Christian faith is rooted in an appreciation for the goodness and the redeemability of the physical creation of God. It's more than alarming to think of the consequences of a Platonic Christianity when the spirit that sneered at Paul's proclamation of Christ takes root in the hearts of those who call themselves Christians, can they really even be called Christians any longer? I'm not suggesting that there is no true and valuable exercise of philosophical reasoning, but we must recognize that whatever treasures Athens has to offer, we must never trade the beauty of Zion to attain them. May God help us to be discerning, and be diligent to make certain that our minds are being renewed in Christ and not according to the wisdom of men which is foolishness to God. However, sneering and mockery was not the only response, and it is not fair to discount Paul's whole speech as a failure. While some mocked, Luke continues that others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Although some readers have understood this as a polite rejection, the subsequent narrative may indicate that this was a sincere offering for further consideration, which, if the rhetorical analysis of the speech being a deliberative discourse is correct, that was exactly what Paul hoped to accomplish. Verse 33, So Paul departed from among them. The trial was ended, and essentially this concludes Luke's record of Paul's Athenian ministry. But first, we learn something even more encouraging than the previous offer. However, some men joined him and believed. The word men is used here generically for people, as evidenced from the identification of one of them as a woman. The phrase joined him and believed almost certainly means they obeyed the gospel and began to constitute a congregation of Christ in the city. Among them, that is among the new disciples, were Dionysius the Areopagite. This is a striking revelation. Regardless of the apparently anticlimactic conclusion to Paul's speech, one of the judges against him was not merely convinced of his innocence of any crime, but accepted his invitation to turn to the true God through his appointed man, Jesus. Another of the disciples was a woman named Damaris. Her being named indicates she was a prominent woman, either within Athenian society or within the church after her conversion. Chrysostom, suggested that she was the wife of Dionysius, 
who according to very old tradition became an elder in the Athenian church, and others with them also. Athens was not exactly fertile soil for the gospel. If anything, the hearts of the citizenry of the glorious city had long been hardened by pride, delusion, and depravity. Yet in just a few places the seed found good ground and took root. In Jesus' parable of the soils, it is often observed that three of the four soils rejected the seed. Thus we are told, we should expect the majority of listeners to reject the gospel. Yet when the parable ends, that which accepted the seed produced as much as a hundredfold harvest. Thus in the final scene, the victory outweighs the defeat. On this day, a small congregation was started in Athens, but in a few years, the last idol temple shut its doors forever, and Greece became an epicenter of worship to Jesus Christ across the world. Jesus can be mocked and ignored, but only for a time. He is Lord of all, and He must reign until all of His enemies are put under His feet. Thanks for listening to Verse by Verse. I'm Clinton DeFrance. I'm a Christian Bible student and evangelist from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this podcast is made available by the Congregation of Christians of which I am a member in East Tulsa. Please come meet us if you have the chance. You can learn more about us at our website, tulsachurchofchrist.com. Our music is from Andrew Martin, a very talented Christian brother in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. You can check out his SoundCloud for more beautiful and uplifting productions from him. For news, articles, previous episodes, or to request a Bible study or a lecture series with me, visit vbvpodcast.com. Please subscribe to the podcast and give us a good review if you enjoy the studies. God bless and have a great week. From all the dark places of earth's heathen races, oh, see how the thick shadows fly. The voice of salvation awakes every nation, come over and help us, they cry. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's better exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of His knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. With praising and singing and jubilant ringing, their arms of rebellion cast down. At last every nation, the Lord of salvation, with glory their effort shall crown. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of His knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea.